Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on The Journey. A complex set of structural barriers have historically perpetuated racial and economic inequality. To properly understand these issues, it is imperative that Howard engage a wide range of expert scholars whose work unapologetically seeks to advance racial equity. By convening HBCUs, developing coursework in economy and society studies, and influencing policy through focused research, we can begin to reimagine how our economies function and who they serve. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick, and my guests today on the journey are Jave Gooms, Assistant Professor with the Department of Economics, and Michael Rao, Chair and Professor in the Department of Afro-American Studies. Dr. Gooms and Dr. Ralph, welcome to the journey. Thank you for having us. Thank I'm you. going to start with you, uh, Dr. Gooms. So anybody with a website always gets me a little bit concerned. But <laughs> being part of a large family from Los Angeles, uh, 11 brothers and sisters, you probably needed your own identity. So first, let's start there. Tell me <laughs> what it was like growing up uh, with 11 siblings. It was great. I have my own personal cheerleading team, <laughs> all my best friends. Um, it was awesome. I really enjoyed growing up with such a strong knit family and a big family. We're all about two years apart. The oldest is actually a Howard graduate. My dad's a Howard graduate and my nephew's currently a Howard student. So Howard's also been always a, um, a held a special heart, a special part in our family. And so tell me where in the birth order you reside. So I was originally the last child, and then my parents decided to have one more child nine years younger than me. So I'm number 11. Okay. So we could consider you the baby. Yeah, yeah The baby works. before the baby. Yeah. <laughs> I get it. The baby before the grandchild. Right, right. <laughs> so as you were going to school, what was your early schooling like in terms of K through 12 uh, in LA at that time? So um, my parents made sure that where we lived, we had great public schools. So I went to I went to public schools, but I'm the daughter. My dad's a PhD in um, electrical or in um, civil engineering. He worked in aerospace, and so education was always a big part of our household. Um, it's no surprise that I do a very math-heavy field now, given my dad's an engineer. But it, it was it was great. Um, but a lot of my learning happened at home, especially when it revolved around. Um, black history, African studies, right? It was books being given to us, reports being done by my parents, extra math workbooks. And so it's no surprise I'm a professor given the, the rigor my parents kind of instilled in us um, from a very young age. And, and I think that, you know, obviously encapsulates a, encapsulates a major part of, I think part of the solution for some of what ails us today in K through 12, you know, and that's parental involvement mm -hmm. is clearly a key to success. Uh, nevertheless, you, uh, instead of coming to the East Coast and um, adding to Howard uh, women's basketball team, you decided to go to uh, Loyola Marymount and play Division One basketball. What was that like and, you know, how many minutes did you get on average? Oh, man, the big question. <laughs> so I would have came to Howard. I, I wasn't recruited by Howard. I, I loved, I, sports is a big part of who I am. I love playing sports. I still play to this day. Um, playing basketball at a collegiate level, was much more glorified than it actually was growing up. Um, it was a lot of work. It was probably a full-time and a part-time job put together, but it was a great experience. Some of my best friends were on my basketball team, and um, we did make it to the NCAA tournament my sophomore year. We lost to Baylor, but I believe the next year, Baylor won the whole tournament. Right. So that, that's a loss we can take. So they were on their way there, so you could take a pass. Yeah. Uh, why economics? What uh, drew you to that field at uh, Loyola? That's a great question. So I was pre-law. Um, I grew up in L.A. during the crack epidemic. I grew up with parents that had a nonprofit to help um, students of color and minorities get into college and help support them getting into college. And so I grew up with this strong sense of wanting to help people that looked like me wanting to give a voice to these individuals that didn't seem to have their voice heard in our society. And so I always thought law was the way. Um, so at LMU, I was pre-law, they have a good law program. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna become a lawyer, I'm gonna help change law. And then I took a 
principles of microclass, and the professor said, well, economists do better on LSATs than political scientists. And when I went into undergrad, I was already pretty far advanced, so I knew I was going to double degree. And so I said, okay, I'll, I'll do economics too. I'm good at math. I can do this. And probably about my junior year of college, I stopped studying for the LSAT, and I started considering a PhD in economics. Um, it was an Esther to Flow paper. We have a professor at LMU that was her student at MIT, and Esther DeFlo does, and now j -Pal, which is like full circle, j -Pal came and spoke to our summer program students for the American Economic Association, which was great. But at the time, Esther DeFlo, who's now a Nobel Prize winner, at the time she was up and coming, and she used economics to try to solve real world problems, try to figure out how can we look at experiments to get teachers in classrooms in, in developing countries? How can we make sure parents in, in East Africa are using or getting the, um, the mosquito nets they need to help um, prevent malaria. And it, it just felt very practical. And, and so I started to really start to investigate and realize that I could use economics the same way I thought I could use law. And actually, I'm not the best at, I, I'm not really that interested in reading a million pages. So economics using math suited me better. But little did I know I read a lot in economics as well. Right, and so you uh, pursued your master's and your PhD at the University of Florida. I did. I took a little time off, worked, traveled, and then started taking master's classes at uh, Cal State to get prepared and to just make sure that, you know, five years in grad school seems like an infinity, feels like a lifetime when you're in your 20s. And so I wasn't quite sure, ready, quite ready to make that jump. And so I took master's classes, and then after a year I said, okay. I'm just going to do this. And so I, yeah, I went to University of Florida, I had to be out of a major city so I can focus, and I had to be away from the West Coast because I have too much family on the West Coast. <laughs> so University of Florida it was. All right, excellent. So Dr. Ralph, uh, your family is originally from Guyana, mm -hmm. uh, but you were born in Vancouver uh, before moving to uh, the East Coast, essentially, up yeah. and down the, the eastern uh, seaboard. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me first a little bit about your family from Guyana. Yeah, well, my parents uh, left Guyana, went to undergrad at University of West Indies, Zamona in Jamaica. That's where my older brother was born. Then my dad did a master's in Canada for one year. That's where I was born. And then they came to New York where my younger brother was born. Uh, and then we grew up on the East Coast, moving around. My mother was a librarian, so, you know, I read a lot. I always tell people I read classics as a young person. Like, I never really read sort of like Diary of a Wimpy Kid or like other kinds of books <laughs> young people read. I was reading like Three Musketeers and like Oliver Twist and things like that. Um, and then my mother would go on to work as a university librarian. And my dad, my dad was a, um, a university sort of administrator or something like that. So kind of moved to different, you know, university towns and things like that. We would, at one point lived in Florida. My mother was at Florida State and my dad was at FAMU, and later um, my mother was at uh, University of Maryland, which was University of Maryland at Baltimore then. My dad was at Bowie State, you know, so I've always been around universities. Okay. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you t tell us a little bit about your K-12 experience mm -hmm. uh, and what influenced your college decision. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an HBCU background as yeah. your foundation. What, what was the influence? There? Well, it's funny, when I talk about how often we moved, people sometimes ask if we were in witness protection or something like that. <laughs> uh, but I just think my parents were looking for different opportunities and, and found different kinds of exciting things. But, you know, as a result of moving a lot, you know, I sort of, I think I learned to interact with different kinds of people and learn about different kinds of communities. And I've sort of discovered over time that many anthropologists have the experience of having moved a lot and learned about a lot of different people, a lot of different places. So I think I had a lot of great training, you know, early on in my school experience. And I was always sort of in gifted and talented programs, things like that. But uh, when I was graduating from high school in Howard County, uh, Oakland Mills High School, I still started to discover uh, what historically black colleges really offered. You know, it felt like a very strong nurturing community. Um, I was sort of initially looking at Ivy League universities, but then my best friend decided he was going to Morehouse College and my older brother, decided to go to Morehouse College. So all of a sudden, I started to focus on HBCUs and I chose Morehouse. I actually got a full scholarship to study management information systems and I was very interested in computer science. I got to Morehouse, took one computer class and I hated it. <laughs> and I thought, well, how can I have a full scholarship to do something I hate, you know? And I realized I never really asked myself what I'd love to do, you know? So I took a broad range of classes, English, history, sociology, all kinds of things. Um, and I was really drawn to kind of interdisciplinary inquiry. 
And so I realized I kind of settled on anthropology because I felt like you could study anything. Like anthropologists study comparative economic systems, ritual dance, religion, the family, you know, as a kind of study of, of human society. It sort of felt like, um, oh, I can, the, the sky's the limit for what I can study. Right. So you started at Morehouse, um, and then you would go to Morris Brown. I yeah. think that's the complete Atlanta experience. Like, <laughs> uh, what was Morris Brown like compared to Morehouse? Well, it was interesting because I decided I wanted, you know, the end of my first year in college, um, I took this class called Psychology of the African American Experience, and I was really compelled by the critique that black psychologists had developed about psychology as a discipline, that you really how need to um, incorporate analysis of cultural difference and social difference to appreciate how people navigate the world. So I decided I wanted to do a PhD in anthropology and I wanted to do Africana Studies undergrad. And Morehouse had African American studies, but they didn't really um, think about the diaspora and its sort of breadth and wholeness, you know, from my perspective. So I was trying to figure out how to major in Africana Studies at Morehouse and they wouldn't let me. So eventually I just transferred to Morris Brown. Yeah. So one of the things that I guess about your career that is interesting, because I talk to students all the time about it, I don't want students to focus on their major, but rather their mission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think your career has been an example of kind of following your mission. If you had to try to describe what your mission is and then how you apply that in terms of where your career took you and, and even the influence of your PhD at the University of Chicago, what would that look like? Well, I think the, I appreciate the question. My, I think I've learned that sort of how we navigate the world and how we access, say, capital or resources um, is shaped by who we are in the world, right? Like our, our racial background, gender, sexuality, our abilities, our expertise, all that shapes how we navigate the world. It also shapes how we're governed, you know? Oftentimes, we're either given access to privilege or denied access based on who we are, based on national origin, our education, expertise, race, gender, sexuality. So I always hold those things in mind in doing research and analysis, like who are we looking at? How does who they are shape what they're able to access? Um, how does who they are shape what they're denied access to? And so I think, um, to your point, it's not so much about the discipline as such, it's more about the, the evidence and the argument and the opportunity to explore different kinds of things, you know? I always tell people that, you know, my research sort of starts with the question of evidence and argument, and then I sort of move to the methodology and those kinds of questions, rather than focusing on a particular uh, disciplinary approach. And so University of Chicago, um, you know, it's, a, it's often described as a place where fun goes to die <laughs> yeah. uh, because of the very academic focus. What was mm -hmm. your experience like? Yeah, well, Chicago is funny. I met um, an older scholar who said to me, oh, you know, you're a grad student at the University of Chicago. How is it? And I said, oh, it's been a great experience, you know. He said, oh, come on, you're a black man at the University of Chicago. You don't have to lie to me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, no, but I actually really enjoy Chicago, I think, because it is a place that's very theoretical, you know. Like, if you love pulling apart questions, interrogating concepts and practices, it's a very exciting place. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's a very diverse city, an amazing city, Chicago. Uh, the student body is not as diverse, nor um, is the makeup of professors as diverse. And that could be disappointing, but I found it to be a very um, dis interdisciplinary place. Like, no matter what you're studying, you have opportunities to do research and different workshops, collaborate with all kinds of scholars across the campus. And I think University of Chicago is well known for economics in particular, you know? And I think we had kind of a rivalry with the econ department in a sense <laughs> of, you know, appreciating their research, but feeling it was pretty narrow. And then wanting to the, expand the boundaries of what they consider to be valid evidence or who they think of as their audience or what they're focused on in their research. So I found it to be a very dynamic, very exciting place. Right. So Dr. Grooms, you know, back to you. Let's start with uh, health. Obviously, I'm a surgeon by training. I've written a lot on healthcare disparities. So in kind of uh, researching you as we were starting to talk to you about the directorship of the center that we'll talk about later, I kind of looked up your work around that. What about health and economics you think is interesting and um, why such a focus in that area now? Interesting. So um, a lot of what has driven my work has been how I grew up, where I grew up, what I witnessed growing up. And so growing up in the 80s and 90s and seeing the crack epidemic and seeing where it predominantly resided and who it predominantly affected. And, you know, as a child and in the 90s, crack using drugs was considered an addiction. And I remember in grad school, um, I started working on a lot of my current research when I was in grad school. It was loosely related to my dissertation, but when I was in grad school, the opiate epidemic started. 
and the verbiage around drug use then became substance abuse or substance use and it became a health infliction opposed to a personal choice and to me that that I, I agree with it 100 percent but I started to think about well what about those individuals from the 90s or 80s where it was considered a personal choice and as a consequence, people went to jail. We had a lot more single-headed households. We had a lot more children in the foster care system. And so what I think sometimes when they, people think economics, it's always, well, should I buy or sell stock? Is the housing market going to go up or down? You know, what's happening with inflation? But really, when we think about economics, there's a lot of other factors that influence it. And health, substance use, mental health is a big component. If you are dealing with substance use or mental health, you can't contribute financially to your household maybe the way that you typically will. Your production goes down. And this has a trickle effect, right, down to your children. And now if, you're, if one parent is working a double job, or is working two jobs, or a double shift, what happens to the child at school? What happens to, we talked about parental involvement in schooling. And so I, I think it was a much more, um, what's happening and what has happened to populations, underserved populations, underrepresented populations, is much more complicated than just working or not working. It's much more complicated than going to college or not going to college. And I think health and understanding the role health plays into it. And while I do mostly mental health and substance use, even you know whether you get screened for prostate cancer early or not, given that for black men the rate of prostate cancer is much higher. Um, you know whether you're aware of this information. I, when people think about misinformation and some of the choices individuals that are black or Hispanic um, make when it relates to health, I remind my students, my oldest sister was born when Tuskegee experiment was still going on. It is not that, is not that far removed, right? So when you wonder why some people maybe feel a bit apprehensive to go to the doctors, um, it, it's not simply because they're ignorant, right? There's other things built in that maybe white populations or the majority don't have to deal with. And so I think it's really un important to um, expose what's happening. And as you're aware of, and as most people are aware of, there's not a lot of economies or um, economists of color. Mm -hmm. There are not a lot of black economists, which in turn, they're not a lot of black health economists. And so making sure that someone that has right this um, experience and this lived experience can add some insight into what may be happening or, or just add a different approach to investigating how policies or how choices may be impacting the health of, um, of communities of color. Okay. Now, just to put, probably put on a thread there, you use a mix of anthropology with algorithms and actuarial sciences. And I think in the modern day world, that interdisciplinary approach is needed. But as you look at kind of some of the root causes and you look at how you're managing modern day methodologies with, you know, old school standard research and data, uh, what do you see kind of as the next beachfront, as it were, um, in terms of working in this area? That's interesting. I don't know that I have a direct um, answer to that, but what I will say is I think you're 100% right. I was trained as a pure economist. Um, and one thing that really helped me was the National Economic Association, which uh, Dr. Swinton, who's the chair of the econ department, he was the president of a couple years ago. But that was that that is the black econ, the major black econ association in the United States. And as a grad student, I stumbled upon them. I went to University of Florida. We had no professors of color. We had one female professor that left my second year. Um, and so no one was doing racial research. Racial research, inequality was not considered economics. Um, I heard professors say that. And so I really found refuge in going to um, National Economic Association conferences, going to the American Society of Hispanic um, Economists. And it was places where I heard um, Professor Spriggs speak, and that resonated with me. I heard Rhonda Sharp, who's at Weiser, Weiser Institute, and I heard Derek Hamilton, who's at New School, and I heard them start talking about how it's important to bring in sociology. It's important to bring in multidisciplinary, qualitative work. And it's something that I was never taught, and I think I'm still learning, um, but I think it's something that makes the research much more meaningful, and it will allow us to get to a root cause and add context to what's happening, not just numbers. Yeah, you know, I, I sit on the Federal Reserve Board for the 5th District in Richmond, and I have to admit, um, you know, when I started some five years ago, uh, we would never discuss that. Like, even the unemployment rate, they would give the unemployment rate, and then I would always be the one to put my hand up and say, 
you know, what is it if you break it down by racial groups? And then it would always consistently be twice that for African Americans. Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, well, I'm not sure these solutions are applicable over here. And I have to admit that now, um, you know, with the leadership at the bank, they've been very consistent about making this an issue, about raising, you know, the specter. And I could feel a palpable change that they recognize that, you know, the blunt instruments we use to try to influence the economy. I mean, the Federal Reserve has two mandates, as you guys know. Um, you know, one is full employment and the other is uh, inflation at 2%. You know, so much for that. And oh. so it's a blunt instrument to use to try to manipulate the interest rates to get there. And so, you know, it's tough, but it's so different based on your lived experience. So with that in mind, you know, we were able to secure um, a $10 million grant from the Hewlett Foundation, um, and for which I'm in, in debt to Larry Kramer to see this vision and have this vision. And we formed a center. It's the Equitable Economy and Sustainable Society Center, E squared, S squared. And both of you, uh, uh, you know, have the mantle of the leadership. I, I think we've picked uh, the two best leaders at this time uh, to lead us there. Can each of you describe kind of your role in the center and what you envision, you know, for the center? I'll start with you, Dr. Coombs. Thank you. Um, so I think we have been working very closely on, um, on our roles, but also on the vision of the center. What I envision is a center that really questions the way we look at current policies and focusing on research that is aiming at dismantling structural barriers that impact inequalities, economic inequalities, health inequalities, even climate and environmental inequalities in our society. And a big aim is having direct um, effect on policy, making sure that the research being done by Howard faculty gets amplified so that it could have impact so that our voices, our research is heard by those individuals making change or making policies. Yeah. And, you know, same question for you, uh, Dr. Ralph, but I'm going to add uh, something on as well for you to comment on, and that is to probably elucidate a bit of what these structural barriers are mm -hmm. that we constantly seem to be encountering. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the center is a very exciting opportunity. I think, as you noted, the Healer Foundation has, you know, provided support for it, and, and the grant is really about sort of, quote unquote, rethinking neoliberalism is sort of how they put it. Um, and in conversations with, you know, Larry Kramer and also Brian Kettering, who's sort of administering the grant, it's very clear that they sort of um, want to identify scholars and institutions who are going to help rethink political and economic relationships, right? To your point about systemic racism, how it affects the economy, we're looking at different sectors of society from health to criminal justice. Um, sustainability, all of these things are obstacles to social mobility, you know, and so it really is an honor, obviously, to be chosen as founding director and for Dr. Grooms to come on as co-director because I think our, our research expertise is very sort of compatible and sort of, um, but we also have, you know, our own domains of expertise that we sort of draw upon, you know, and I think um, one of the things we're sort of exploring is how to kind of turn the center into kind of a hub for exciting faculty research, um, how to train students in interdisciplinary research methods, you know. As we both noted, it's our sort of training and the training we received and then the training we've done after the training we received that leaves us poised to respond to these questions. Um, you know, one thing we've noticed, for instance, is that while we think of it as different sectors, uh, criminal justice, health, asset inequality, we also see how they're related, like um, the question of sustainability and climate change affects even health outcomes, right? Obviously, we've looked at research that points out that um, pollen counts are shaping asthma and allergies among young African-American people, right? And, um, you know, criminal justice, uh, mass incarceration leaves people often in debt, right? And causes all kinds of sort of economic inequality. So we're sort of looking at these distinct sectors of society, but also looking at how they interact with each other. Um, one really exciting initiative we're trying to develop is something we're calling the 1513 Project. In some ways, it's almost like a prequel to um, the Cohenna Jones 1619 Project. Um, we sort of noted that um, African Americans were in the U.S. as early as 1513, but sometimes as part of expeditions with Spanish explorers and conquistadors and things like that. But we're also using that earlier time frame to think about the origins of capitalism as we know it 
the origins of formation of difference in society as we know it, and to really kind of tackle some of these pressing social problems at their origins and at their root. Now, uh, both of you obviously have been recruited here within uh, the past uh, few years, and mm -hmm. you know my intent is to have you here uh, forever. Uh, I think we're building a very exciting faculty at this time. I look at, I go to the faculty, uh, new faculty orientations, and I'm always excited to meet faculty like yourself. You could be anywhere in the country, both of you. We mm -hmm. recruited you from uh, very competitive places. Why Howard University? <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Um, it's a conversation I have with my husband often. I can't duplicate what Howard has anywhere else. Um, the legacy of Howard, but I also can't duplicate what my econ department. It is not everywhere, it's not in all econ departments throughout the United States that you can do racial inequality and disparity work and have the support of your senior colleagues and um, your other colleagues. And there's not very many HBCUs in the country that have a PhD program in economics. We have a PhD program, we have a master's program. So not only do I get to do meaningful research, I get to influence those individuals that are going to go on and the next generation of, of economists that are going to do meaningful research and continue to have an impact. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't, you know, I can't even say what it would have meant to be at Howard at an earlier moment or what it would mean to be at Howard in the future, but I can confidently say it's the most exciting place to be right now, and that's what drew me here. I mean, I always admired Howard University because it seems to me, not only is it a historically black college, produced so many luminaries from Thurgood Marshall, Felicia Rashad, Toni Morrison, Zorna Hurston, but all have important ties to Howard. But I think also um, it has everything you'd want in a university. It feels like, you know, uh, medical school, law school, um, film, drama. You know, many historically black colleges, and even those I attended, were small undergrad liberal arts colleges, you know. But to have such a dynamic historically black college that offers everything is very exciting. But also, you know, as I was arriving here, you know, I was already in conversations to come, and then ta Coates was on his way, Felice Rashad was coming back as a dean. Um, you know, there's so many exciting faculty being recruited at this juncture, so many exciting initiatives. And then, you know, even at a commencement dinner, I remember sitting by um, the dean of social work, and she was talking about how she insisted that the students come back to campus during the pandemic to train as social workers. And she said, you know, part of her mission is to train them to go to places in the South to serve elderly people who may have rather derogatory views of black people, but that nonetheless, they may be employed in a capacity trying to help people, heal people who don't even appreciate them or don't fully understand them, right? And I was just struck by her bravery and insight and dedication. And so there's all kinds of extraordinary triple alum and as I tell people all the time I'm deeply in love with this place my romance of this place is uh, unbelievable uh, if there's a jug of Kool-Aid I've had a few <laughs> I've had a few of the jugs and uh, I'm trying to just uh, leave a little bit for everybody else but the place is intoxicating and a big part of the reason is because of uh, people like both of you I think we have the most exciting faculty in America right now and uh, you're right um, you know it could be it was a different place uh, in the past it will be a different place in the future but uh, the two of you get to shape a lot of that uh, by your work, so thank you for being here. Thanks for being here. My guests today were Dr. Javay Grooms, Assistant Professor with the Department of Economics, and Dr. Michael Ralph, Chair and Professor in the Department of Afro-American Studies. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.